If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network. Gregory Woolley was a Haitian-born Canadian mobster who allied with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. He was the protégé and bodyguard of Maurice Boucher, a controversial senior Hells Angels leader who led his chapter in a long and extremely violent gang war against the Rock Machine MC in Quebec from 1994 to 2002. Greg was known in Montreal as the godfather of the streets. Woolley grew up poor in the St. Michel neighborhood of Montreal, the child of Haitian immigrants. His parents had fled the poverty of their native land and the tyranny of President for Life Jean-Claude Duvalier, known to the Haitians as Baby Doc, to distinguish him from his father, President for Life Dr. Francois Duvalier, the Papa Doc. From his teenage years, Greg was involved in a street gangs in St. Michel. He committed his first known murder at the age of 17 when he killed a rival Haitian-Canadian street gangster, which gave him the nickname of Picasso. Woolley was the leader of a street gang known as Master B, which purchased drugs from the Hells Angels Montreal chapter. Boucher had once belonged to a white supremacist biker gang known as the SS that existed to beat up non-white immigrants. Boucher's son, Francis Boucher, is an avowed Nazi who had started the Aryan Fest musical festival in 1992 for fascist and white supremacist musical acts and which existed only to glorify Nazism. The Aryan Fest remained the premier annual musical gathering for racist bands and singers. Despite this background, Woolley was very close to Maurice Boucher and served as a bodyguard. The Hells Angels are a whites-only group, and Boucher made Woolley the president of the Rockers Motor Club puppet gang. The journalist Jerry Langton wrote, Boucher appears to have been right about Woolley, who became a very big earner. He became wealthier, in fact, than many Hells Angels and several nomads, an enthusiastic intimidator, and a loyal member who never informed on anyone. The Rockers, were not like the other Hells Angels puppet gangs, like the Evil Ones, the Rowdy Ones, and the Condors, which merely performed the same work as the Hells Angels. The Rockers were exclusively the enforcement arm of the Hells Angels, divided into a baseball team, which committed assaults and arson, and the football team, which committed murders. Woolley served as the bodyguard for Boucher, and was the best assassin working for the Angels. Woolley was known as Picasso in the Montreal underworld because it was said that he was such an artist when it came to killing, having first killed at the age of 17 when he killed another Haitian immigrant and gang member. Woolley was said to have done such an exquisite job at carving up his rival that he earned the nickname Picasso and he was ultimately made the president of the Rockers by Boucher, becoming the first black man to ever head an outlaw biker club in Canada. Francis Boucher joined the Rockers with the aim of following his father into the Hells Angels, which put him under Woolley's authority. Besides for the Hells Angels, Woolley's closest allies were members of the Young Turk faction of the Rizzuto crime family, such as Francesco Arcadi, Lorenzo Giordano, and Francesco del Balso. On December 20, 1996, Woolley murdered a rock machine biker, Pierre Beauchamp, whom he shot and killed when he was using his pager inside of his truck, which was parked on the street. Woolley fled in an automobile with stolen license plates, which he later abandoned to take the metro. The getaway driver was another rocker, René Balloon Charlebois, whom Woolley was to be closely associate with. Found abandoned near the metro station was the gun used to kill Beauchamp, along with a toque, which had some hair samples. Afterwards, Woolley went to a bar to tell several other rockers that he had just gotten one for the Hells Angels. Woolley told another rocker, Stéphane Sirois, who later turned Crown's evidence that the orders to kill Beauchamp 
had come from Boucher, who told him not to take any money from Beauchamp, as Boucher did not want Montrealers to think that the murder was a drug deal gone bad. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP informer within the Rockers, Danny Kane reported to his handlers in February 1997 that the Hells Angels had taken control of almost all of the rock machine's former drug markets. Kane further reported that the Hells Angels were set upon taking control of the rock machine's last strongholds of Point Saint-Charles, Verdun, Lasalle, Saint-Henri, Lachine, Villemard and Court Saint-Paul. Kane continued that the rockers had set up a death squad whose principal members were Woolley, Pierre Provencher, Normand Robitaille, Stephen Falls, and Stéphane Gagné. Kane added that the members of the Rockers' death squad were to receive 30% of the profits from drug sales once the Hells Angels had taken control of the last rock machine drug markets. On the 28th of March 1997, the rocker hitman Aimé Samard, acting under Woolley's orders, murdered a rock machine biker Jean-Marc Casey as he entered a Montreal arena to play hockey with his friends. After Samard was arrested in April 1997, he turned Crown's evidence and named Woolley as the man who gave him the orders to kill Casey. He was charged with first-degree murder, but Samard proved to be a poor witness on the stand and Greg was acquitted. He was little known to the public until 1998, when he came to public attention as the chief security officer at a Hells Angels funeral. At the funeral, Woolley was seen giving orders to Francis Boucher. Montreal police officer stated in 2002, when you're in a position to boss around Maurice Mom Boucher's kid, you're somebody. Woolley had no hope of ever being allowed to join the Hells Angels, but he seemed very determined to make a career in the Rockers. When Greg left the Master B gang to join the Rockers, his old gang fell apart. Another, Haitian immigrant who once belonged to Master B, Beauvoir Jean, founded a new gang, the Bogars, which is Haitian French slang for handsome boys. Woolley founded another gang, the Syndicate, likewise made of young men of a Haitian background to oppose the Bogars. The Bogars waged a propaganda campaign against Woolley that depicted him as an Uncle Tom, figure serving the clearly racist Hells Angels. Langton wrote the claims of the Bogars were true, but ridiculous, as the Bogars worked for the Rizzuto family, and if either of the groups was more under the thumb of a largely racist white organization, it was the Bogars. The Bogars decided to rebrand themselves as the Bloods, while the syndicate, along with their puppet gang, the Crackdown Posse, rebranded themselves as the Crips. Unlike the Hells Angels, neither the Bloods nor the Crips of Los Angeles had copyrighted their symbols, and the two Montreal gangs had no connection with the American Bloods and Crips gangs. Langton wrote, the LA Crips and Bloods were not asked or consulted. In all likelihood, they had no idea that there were Crips and Bloods in Montreal, if they even knew where Montreal was. Woolley, who had often worn red and white clothing, red and white are the colors of the Hells Angels, was now forbidden to wear red, red is the color of the Bloods, and had to wear a blue baseball cap and blue clothing. Langton described Woolley as too smart to engage in alleyway beatings. Woolley had the crackdown posse serve as a puppet gang for the Montreal Crips. The relationship between the Montreal Crips and the crackdown posse was analogous to the relationship between the Hells Angels and the Rockers. The crackdown posse operated in the St. Michel neighborhood engaged in robbing depreneur, convenience stores, and protection rackets. In 1998, Woolley merged the crackdown posse and the Rockers together to form the syndicate. In August 1999, a bizarre incident occurred on the streets of Montreal when Greg was riding his Harley-Davidson motorcycle while wearing his rocker patch on his vest and was pulled over for speeding. 
The constable who pulled over Woolley, Michel Bureau, claimed he was frightened when he noticed that he had something under his vest, saying that he knew Greg was an especially violent man as he was the only black outlaw biker in Montreal. Constable Bureau offered to drop the speeding fine if he would show him what was under his vest. When Woolley refused, Constable Bureau said it didn't matter if Woolley was carrying drugs, he was willing to drop the charges just as long as Woolley showed him what was under his vest. When Woolley informed Bureau that he was not under arrest and that it was none of his business what he had under his vest, Bureau called for backup too. And thus, it took five officers to arrest Woolley for speeding. No guns or drugs were found on Woolley, though a handgun was found lying on the streets close to the arrest scene which Woolley's lawyers claimed was planted by the police. Later, the judge threw out all of the charges, ruling that this was not a routine pullover, and suggested it was an unusually clumsy attempt on the part of the police to entrap Woolley. During his time in jail, while awaiting the charges, Woolley was involved in three different fights with the other inmates and an attempt to smuggle PCP into the jail before finally being separated from the other inmates on the grounds he was too violent. On April 5th, 2000, Woolley was arrested while boarding a flight to Port-au-Prince when airport security discovered he was taking a handgun to Haiti. Following his conviction, he was sent to prison, where he was attacked by another prisoner on January 31st, 2001. Prison officials stated it was a suicidal gesture on the part of the man who had attacked him. Despite a fondness for traditional old-school policing, Commander André Bouchard pressed very strongly in the 1990s for the Montreal police adopt modern scientific methods, most notably in pressuring the city to pay for a DNA lab. Bouchard had assigned two detectives, Louis-Marc Pelletier and Michel Tremblay, to see if it was possible to match a list of suspects in various murders provided by the informer Danny Kane with DNA evidence. The detectives collected DNA from the Hells Angels and the Rockers by seizing items left in public, such as discarded cigarettes and used plastic coffee cups, and then sought to match the DNA samples with DNA found on crime scenes, which led them to Woolley. Pelletier and Tremblay matched DNA samples from the hair found in a toque, discovered alongside the discarded gun that had been used to kill Beauchamp to Woolley. By February 2001, Bouchard's major crimes unit had enough evidence to charge 42 Hells Angels and Rockers with some 23 counts of first-degree murder. On the 30th of March 2001, the police launched Operation Springtime that saw all of the members of the Rockers arrested, including Woolley. He was suspected of several murders on behalf of the Hells Angels. Commander André Bouchard of the Service de Police de la Ville de Montréal thought that the first one arrested to make a deal with the Crown would be Woolley, the Rockers president who, as a black man, was not allowed to join the Hells Angels proper. Bouchard said of Woolley, we've got him cold, and his lawyer knew it. We've got DNA. I mean, he was dead. What more do you need? Son of a bitch. He was the only one who really never said a word. By contrast, Woolley's associate, René Balloon Charlebois, the rocker who had been promoted up to the Hells Angels proper, broke down in tears and wanted to make a deal with the Crown for a lesser prison sentence. Commander Bouchard told Charlebois, F*** you. No deal for you which caused Charlebois to cry even more, while Woolley maintained a stony silence. Woolley was charged with conspiracy to traffic in narcotics and with first-degree murder for the slaying of rock machine biker Pierre Beauchamp on December 20th, 1996. A psychological evaluation done after his arrest found that Woolley's main issue was his uncontrollable rage, as the psychologist discovered that he was an extremely violent man, 
prone to excessive anger and murderous tendencies. The psychologist also found that Woolley had poor judgment. Greg's relations with the Rizzuto family came to be fraught after Vito Rizzuto was arrested in January 2004, following an extradition request from the United States. Woolley had a close friendship with Giordano, but his relations with Arcadi were described as being venomous. Woolley was tried twice for Beauchamp's murder and was acquitted both times, as the defense lawyers argued that the DNA evidence that the Crown had introduced was planted. While awaiting trial at the Steander Plains jail, Woolley came to be friends with Rizzuto, who being held there while he fought the extradition request. In 2005, Rizzuto and Woolley were often seen talking in French in the prison courtyard. In 2005, Woolley was convicted of other charges and was sent to serve his sentence at Kingston Penitentiary. On June 27, 2005, in a plea bargain, Woolley pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to traffic in narcotics, and gangsterism, while the first-degree murder charges were dropped. Even while held at Kingston Penitentiary, Woolley was described as controlling the drug trade from his prison cell and had a monthly income of $10,000. In 2006, Woolley punched out another prisoner who questioned his authority, whom was almost stabbed to death minutes later. In 2008, the National Parole Board turned down Woolley's request for parole under the grounds. No matter where you find yourself in custody, the power conferred on you by your official status among bikers and implicitly as the head of street gangs is of such a scale that no rehabilitation program can sufficiently protect the public from the risk you represent. On February 13, 2009, Greg Woolley was arrested as part of Operation Axe and thereby acquired the dubious honour of being the first Canadian to be charged with gangsterism twice. In January 2011, he made a plea bargain with the Crown, where he pleaded guilty to the Operation Axe charges in exchange for a lesser prison sentence. Later in 2011, he was released on full parole and returned to Montreal. During the civil war that tore apart apart the Rizzuto family, between Reynald Desjardins and Vito Rizzuto in the early 2010s, Woolley supported the latter, and he was often called upon for help from Rizzuto, who seems to have much respect for Woolley's abilities as a leader and as a killer. The renegade faction within the Rizzuto family, led by Desjardins and his brother-in-law, Joseph Di Maolo, had the support of the Ndrangheta families of Ontario in a bid to topple Rizzuto. In 2010, the murders of Paolo Renda and Niccolo Rizzuto were major blows to Rizzuto's leadership of his crime family, and a number of Rizzuto family capos defected over to the Desjardins di Maolo faction, which appeared to be the stronger faction. There was a period in 2010-2011 when Rizzuto came close to losing control of his own crime family. The support of the Hells Angels along with Woolley were described as being crucial in helping Rizzuto survive the challenge. The gangster Andrew Scopper told the journalists Felix Sagen and Eric Thabal that he brought in Gregory Woolley to get the bikers on his side. Vito was okay with Woolley because he knew him and he liked him. Scopper described Greg as a pro who was very useful for Rizzuto in beating back the challenge posed by the Desjardins di Maolo faction. Between 2011 to 2017, at least 12 members of the Desjardins faction were killed. In August 2012, Woolley called for a meeting of various black Canadian street gang leaders in saint Adele, where he called for a union of all the street gangs under his leadership. In turn, the Hells Angels and the Rizzuto family were behind Woolley's efforts to unite all of the black street gangs of Montreal. A Haitian-Canadian gang leader who attended the meeting, Chenier Dupuis, refused the offer, 
saying it was a shame that Wooly was working for the racist Hells Angels, and slapped Wooly across the face. A friend of Dupuis told the journalist Eric Tabot, like many veterans of the Bloods, Chenier said he wanted no part of Wooly. He said he would never work for the bikers. One Haitian Canadian street gang leader who refused his call, Chenier Dupuis, was murdered inside of his SUV on the 13th of August 2012, while Dupuis' deputy, Lamartine Sever Paul, was murdered a few hours later outside of his apartment. With Dupuis and Paul removed from the scene, the planned merger went ahead. Woolley was described as the business partner of Rizzuto. When Rizzuto died, Woolley attended his funeral alongside a number of Hells Angels leaders from Quebec and Ontario, and was given a place of honour at his funeral service, despite not being a mafiosi, which indicated that he was considered to be an important ally. The journalist Julian Scher stated, the Montreal Mafia leaders considered Woolley to be an equal to them. Woolley was often seen with Leonardo Rizzuto, the son of Vito, who is described as being his successor, along with Stefano Solicito. In July 2015, Boucher, who was loyal to the Rizzuto faction, ordered from his prison cell for Woolley to kill Desjardins. In August 2015, Solicito was recorded by a police wiretap as telling Leonardo Rizzuto, we share business. We share things with Greg. We share big secrets. Solecito described Woolley as more trustworthy and reliable than some other members of the Rizzuto family. Both Solecito and Rizzuto described Greg as an equal to the Rizzuto family. In November 2015, he and 47 suspected underworld leaders were arrested in a sweep. Police claim the sweep revealed Woolley was part of a conspiracy to murder another underworld figure, Reynold Desjardins. In May 2016, lawyers for Woolley and Boucher were able to stymie the preliminary inquiry phrase of the trial, saying both men wanted to attend the preliminary inquiry sessions, but demanded a change in venue, saying the Guen courthouse was unsafe for their clients. In October 2018, Greg Woolley was found guilty of conspiracy to traffic in narcotics and gangsterism. Project Magot Mastiff, as the police investigation was known, established that Woolley had sold 192 kilograms of cocaine in the Hochelaga Maisonneuve borough of Montreal between 2011 to 2015. On October 27, 2018, in a plea bargain, the Crown dropped the conspiracy to commit murder charges in relation to the Desjardins murder plot against Woolley in exchange for him pleading guilty to the Project Magot Mastiff charges. In a statement of fact at the plea bargain, it was established that Woolley, along with another drug dealer, Danny Lou Sprintz's cadet, were part of a select group known as Le Bronze, who were permitted to buy cocaine at a favourable price from the Rizzuto family. In April 2019, Greg was convicted of selling methamphetamine in Bordeaux prison, for which he received a light sentence. In November 2021, Woolley was released on full parole. Woolley was engaged to Christelle Watt, a French-Canadian woman who was a reality TV star in Quebec on the Loft Story TV show between 2007-2009. Hout is well known in Quebec as the Loft Exhibitionist, owing to her frequent nudity and general flamboyant behaviour. The couple lived in a luxury mansion in St. John sur Richelieu, worth $3.8 million, that had such features as a 400-bottle cellar, a built-in sound system, an in-ground swimming pool, separate accommodation, and 70,000 square feet of wooded land. The house was held in Hout's name only, and in 2022, it became the object of a dispute with the Canada Revenue Agency over claims of unpaid taxes. In May 2022, a drive-by shooting occurred with someone opening fire on Greg's house. In August 2022, somebody burned down his garage. Although the Hells Angels' official policies are not racist, experts say many Hells Angels members are racist 
and it is rare for individuals of African ethnic heritage to join Hells Angels chapters. Woolly, whose ethnic background is Haitian, is described as a rare instance of an individual with African ethnic heritage to rise to a senior position in the Hells Angels. Prior to joining the Hells Angels, Woolley's mentor Boucher was in a smaller motorcycle gang called the SS, which had an explicit white supremacist ideology. Woolley was killed in a shooting in saint jean sur richelieu Quebec, on November 17, 2023, aged 51. Woolley was shot dead in a parking lot in front of his fiancée, Christelle Huot, and their child. Woolley's murder was a major violation of the Underworld Code in Canada, which forbids murders in front of wives and children. Mafia expert Antonio Nicasso wrote that Greg's murder was likely mafia-related. The one in Montreal is an endless war. The latest murder is yet another attack on the power of what was once considered the most powerful crime family in Canada. If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network. Giordano was a member of a Rizzuto family crew who reported to Francesco Arcadi. Alongside Francesco del Balso, Giordano was a member of the Young Turk faction of the younger, more aggressive mobsters. The Canadian journalists André Sedelo and André Noel wrote, Arcadi's crew answered to the Rizzuto clan, but most of its young members lacked the judgment of old-school mobsters like Vito's father, Niccolò and Paolo Renda. Aggressive, impulsive, they seemed not to care about the consequences of their actions. Giordano's favorite meeting place was the bar Lenek in Laval. Like Arcadi, Giordano often associated with Gregory Woolley, the boss of both the Syndicate Street Gang and the Hells Angels Puppet Gang, the Rockers Motorcycle Club. Giordano's usual partner was Del Balso, whom he usually met at the bar Lenek. Del Balso was seen as the leader of the Young Turk faction of the Rizzuto family. The Young Turks were closely allied with the Syndicate, a Haitian-Canadian street gang led by Gregory Woolley, who also served as the president of the Rockers Motorcycle Club, which in turn was a puppet gang of the Hells Angels. Alongside Lorenzo Giordano, Del Balso worked for Francesco Arcadi. Described as pugnacious and aggressive, Del Balso and Giordano tended to work with the Hells Angels and street gangs such as the Syndicate. Considered to be one of the most intimidating leaders of the Rizzuto family, Del Balso was the man most assigned to talk to debtors. After Rizzuto was arrested in 2004, a committee of caretaker leaders for Vito Rizzuto was formed of Del Balso, Niccolo Rizzuto, Paolo Renda, Rocco Solicito, Francesco Arcadi, and Lorenzo Giordano. Giordano's nickname of the skunk related to the fact that his hair was black, except for a white streak in the middle. On the 24th September 2003, Giordano went driving his new Ferrari under the influence of alcohol and smashed his car in a traffic incident. The next day, Giordano called a Rizzuto family soldier, Mike Lapola, to tell him, my wife is gonna kill me, if she learnt of his traffic incident, leading to Lapola to say that he would testify that it was him who was driving the Ferrari at the time of the accident. In a phone call recorded by the police, Del Balso told Giordano to take his wrecked Ferrari to an automobile repair shop owned by John Scotty, whom Del Balso described as a master at disguising cars. The policeman at the scene of the accident discovered a part of a blue Ferrari bumper, which allowed him to discover that it came from a Ferrari listed as belonging to a numbered company whose owner was Richard Krolick, a bookmaker for the Rizzuto family. The matter was settled when Lapola confessed that he was the alleged driver of the Ferrari at the time of the accident, even though he clearly knew no details of the accident when giving his statement to the police. After Rizzuto's arrest following an extradition request from the United States in January 2004, a number of other gangsters attempted to challenge the duopoly on selling cocaine and heroin held by the Rizzuto family 
and the Hells Angels. One such drug dealer was an Iranian immigrant, Essi Navad Noruzi, better known by his alias Javad Mohammad Nozarian, who sold heroin below the price set by the Rizzuto family. On April 18, 2004, Giordano ran into Nozarian at the Globe, an expensive restaurant, and decided to kill him right on the spot. During the struggle, Nozarian drew up his handgun, but Giordano stabbed him repeatedly. The struggle ended with Giordano seizing Nozarian's gun, which he used to shoot Nozarian in the groin and shot off both of his testicles. Nozarian survived the shooting, but followed the underworld code and refused to testify against Giordano. Paolo Renda harshly criticized Giordano for the brawl with Nozarian and for not killing him, as left open the possibility that Nazarian might turn Crown's evidence. Render often chided Giordano for his heavy drinking and his impulsive behavior. The journalists Peter Edwards and Antonito Nicasso described Giordano as a fit man with a tough reputation. On November 2, 2004, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police installed a secret camera inside the bar Lenek in Laval, which over the next two years recorded Giordano visiting the bar 221 times, while Del Balso visited the bar 541 times. Giordano and Del Balso ran an online gambling website whose clients were recruited via telemarketing. The website was based in Belize and then moved to the Kanawake Mohawk Reserve after a gambling license was granted to the Kanawake Reserve Band Council. Between 2004 and 2005, the website had 1,609 users who made 820,000 bets, which allowed the Rizzuto family to make a profit of $26.8 million. Frank Faustini, a baggage handler with Air Canada, had run up an $823,000 gambling debt via their gambling website. On December 15, 2004, Faustini was summoned to the bar Lenek by Del Balso, and the RCMP cameras recorded him along with Giordano and another Rizzuto family soldier, Mike Lapola, beating Faustini. Giordano's shirt ended up being socked in Faustini's blood. Giordano was used by Arakti to threaten restaurant owners to buy Mocadoro coffee and smashed up a restaurant in Boucherville after the owner refused a request that he only buy Mocadoro coffee. On January 1, 2005, in a phone call to Arakti that the police had bugged, Giordano admitted that he was a sadist who enjoyed violence and inflicting pain on others, saying of one beating he had inflicted, we gave it good. On March 9, 2005, Lapola was murdered on the dance of the Moombas nightclub by Thierry Beaubrun, a member of the crackdown posse gang, who in turn was killed by Lapola's bodyguards. Giordano, who was present at the shooting, gave an account of the incident to the Rizzuto family, executive, at the Consensus Social Club the next day. Giordano stated that Lapola had no chance. On November 25, 2005, he and Del Balso stormed into the office of John Xanthodakis, the owner of the bankrupt Norshield Financial Group at the Place Ville-Marie. Giordano and Del Balso ordered one of their thugs, Carols Narvaez Orellana, to beat Xanthodakis in his office. Xanthodakis's face required 12 stitches to repair the fractures caused by Aurelin's fists. On March 8, 2006, Aurelin, Giordano and Del Balso were charged with assaulting Xanthodakis, but the charges were dropped after Xanthodakis refused to testify following death threats. In August 2006, Giordano, often with Arakdi, Del Balso and Giuseppe Fetta met in a Woodbridge, Ontario restaurant with Antonio Coluccio, where it was agreed that in exchange for the Coluccio family paying off the gambling debts of the hitman Salvatore Calauti that were owed to Del Balso, Calauti would work for the Coluccio family. Later in August 2006, Giordano was drinking with Del Balso and Charles Hunault, a Hells Angels supporter at the Cavalli restaurant. Under the influence of alcohol, Hunault was involved in a brawl with Giordano and Del Balso, which led to his expulsion. As Hunault was getting into his car, Giordano followed him out to the street and opened fire. Giordano was arrested for possession of a weapon for a dangerous purpose. On August 30, 2006, Domenico Marchi, 
a cousin of Arachtes, was killed in a case of mistaken identity. At a meeting at the Consensus Social Club the next day, attended by Renda, Arachti, Del Balso, Rocco Solicito, Nicolo Rizzuto, Moreno Gallo, and Tony Mucci, Giordano pressed for swift vengeance. The RCMP bugs recorded Giordano as saying in Italian to Arachti, they got one of ours this time. We can't let this pass. On the 26th of November 2006, the RCMP issued a warrant for Giordano's arrest as part of the four-year Royal Canadian Mounted Police investigation, known as Project Colossae. Giordano evaded the RCMP, dyed his hair all black, underwent plastic surgery and fled to Toronto. He was arrested in a Toronto gym on May 9, 2007. Giordano pled guilty on September 18, 2008, to general conspiracy to commit extortion, bookmaking, illegal gaming, as well as being in possession of the proceeds of crime, and was sentenced to eight years imprisonment. On February 9, 2009, Giordano was sentenced to 15 years in prison, reduced to 10 years on time served. He was released on parole in December 2015. While out on parole, Giordano was murdered on March 1, 2016, being shot dead in his car in Laval. Just months later, Rocco Solicito was shot to death in Laval. He was 67 years old at the time of his death. On October 17, 2019, Jonathan Massari, Domenico Scarfo, Guy Dion, and Marie Jose Vio were arrested and charged with planning and executing the murders of Solicito and Giordano. With the testimonies of Dion and Vio, Scarfo was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder of both Solicito and Giordano, and sentenced to 25 years in prison on April 11, 2022. And Massari pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder of both Solicito and Giordano, and sentenced to 25 years in prison on March 13, 2023. In a statement of fact read out to the courtroom as part of his plea bargain, Massari stated that the leaders of the conspiracy were the Calabrian brothers Salvatore and Andrea Scopa. You're watching the Everything Network.